you might right off the bat wonder what's a geologist doing talking about rivers because we you know think geologists study rocks and I'm not sort of a conventional geologist in that regard. Here's my rock collection, um, and, <laughs> and, and and what it consists of is my quest to find a perfectly a, a, a river cobble that's been perfectly rounded spherical by bedload transport. So this is the three closest ones thus far. So I I anticipate that collection will grow uh, at some point. So yeah, I study rivers. Um, I'm a geomorphologist, uh, which means I study earth surface processes, rivers, glaciers, groundwater, anything that, that uh, can shape the earth's surface. <laughs> and because I emphasize rivers, I'm uh, considered a fluvial geomorphologist. So that's fun for cocktail parties when people say what you do. <laughs> How do you spell that? Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, and this is, this is the, I got Nancy Williams over in the provost's office to dig this up for me, but this is the ad I responded to back in 1987. Uh, Lafayette was looking for two geologists, a structural geologist and a geomorphologist. So uh, that's what they were looking for, and for better or worse, that's what they have. Um, I also would maybe spend a minute giving you an idea of what kind of things a geologist studying rivers would do. Uh, when I responded to that ad, I was just finishing up modeling braided rivers in, in this flume. So this is a 60 feet long, 6 feet wide, can adjust the slope and energy, water supply, sediment feed. And what I did in there was model braided rivers. Okay? You'll hear a lot about those today. Um, so I did most of my PhD work was experimental in a flume. I also looked at a number of rivers in Nebraska, uh, Arizona, um, Montana to corroborate uh, my experimental results. Then when I got to Lafayette, it was an old saying, you know, there's a picture of me when I was younger, but as they say, right, every picture of you is of you when you were younger. <laughs> <laughs> But uh, when I got to Lafayette, first four years or so, I'd take a student, go up to Alaska, and worked on a number of braided rivers there. And we surveyed uh, bar formation uh, to, to see how these braid bars form. Uh, we'd go out there with a velocity meter and a bed load sampler and uh, capture sediment and, and measure velocity. So here, I'm out here with the velocity meter measuring velocity. And we'd survey all those points in and then always write this stuff up in, uh, in journals. Uh, since about 1997, I've been working in Nevada uh, with a group of ecologists and hydrologists looking at wet meadow ecosystems. <coughs> the problem out there is uh, some of these things are prone to rapid incision and they transform from wet wetland meadows to, uh, to, to, to dry meadows and, and these are valuable habitat and so we publish a whole bunch of uh, stuff and more papers on, on, on that work. And this is the first year since 97, I haven't been out there. Uh, then in the early part of this century, I got a chance to go back up to Alaska and work on the Matanuska River with a group of people from Lehigh and Penn State um, and look at sediment transport on this river to try to get a sense of what the erosive efficiency is of that glacier. Um, what else? Uh, also earlier, in probably about 2002 to 2005, working on uh, the Rio Pilcomayo in Bolivia, the watershed has been impacted by metal, uh, by silver mining since uh, 1500s. Spanish open uh, silver mines here then. And so we used lead isotopes to, to try to fingerprint contamination metals in this river that, that are tied to the mining as opposed to background uh, material. So it's a braided river. So I sort of got back to braided rivers a little bit. Um, we did some crazy stuff here. We couldn't get, it's in the Andes, so we couldn't get access to the river. So one day we said, well, let's get some rafts and raft it. And it was really a stupid thing to do. We drove as far as we could, walked our rafts down the tributary, um, and then set off. And this was our our practice, you know, we, we <laughs> put this raft in a swimming pool and uh, it was woefully inadequate preparation. Um, and because I canoe, they made me the helmsman and, um, you know, we encountered rapids we didn't anticipate, got launched out. I mean, it was, it was a crazy thing to do, but we got data um, and it was, it was fun. So I, I keep getting drawn back to braided rivers and we publish some of this stuff in a variety of places. What's a braided river? <laughs> Pay attention. That's so you don't fall asleep. I'm gonna, it, it's a river that consists of multiple channels that weave around bars um, and islands. Uh, I also do some work around here um, and work with David Brandis, who's going to talk to you tomorrow as well. And um, so everything I do sort of falls into this fluvial geomorphology category one way or the other. And this past week, we are working down on the Bushkill Creek with some students. Uh, this is a team of students of mine and David's, and we're looking at uh, legacy sediments trapped above a dam down here uh, on the Bushkill Creek. And so we revive recording to extract samples, and, and uh, this student, Mayor Kate, is going to look at um, metal content in there, uh, presumably, uh, from industrial activity here. And, 
And this student here is actually my son. Um, so, okay, so that's what we do. So what are we going to do today? We're going to talk about river function and form. You see rivers all over the world. Um, so my objective here today is to demonstrate to you that river morphology is not a random thing, that um, it reflects the sediment load that a river is transporting and the energy regime that a river has. And the energy comes from the channel slope and the discharge. So that's the overall objective. And then we'll go to the Platte River in Nebraska and show you an example of a river that's morphologically changing from a braided river to a more single channel river because of land use changes. And then uh, demonstrate how that can have a major impact on, on wildlife, in this particular case, uh, sandhill cranes and uh, whooping cranes. Okay? So that's what we're going to do today. Here's how we're going to get there. I'll give you a quick overview of river morphology. Briefly talk about how rivers transport sediments, their fundamental job, one of their two fundamental jobs, and then uh, explain what, where they get energy to do this work. Uh, and then we'll look at channel morphology. What, what controls what a channel looks like in cross-section? What about the longitudinal profile or slope? And then channel pattern in plan view in three dimensions and tie this all together. Um, and then we'll spend a little bit of time talking about fully braided rivers. Uh, why are some rivers like that? What factors are conducive? We'll talk. Now you're perking up, I see. Some of you say, oh, bars. We're going to um, <laughs> talk about bars. Um, and I'll explain to you how, uh, how braid bars form. And then finally, we'll look at the Platte River okay? and, and, and show how changes in the controlling variables, if they change, it might elicit a, a, a big change in, in the river system. Okay? okay, so here's the overview. So you look at rivers, and this suite of rivers demonstrates rather quickly that that they all don't necessarily look the same. Here you have a sinuous, highly sinuous uh, channel, and it's sort of similar in width as you move down through the, the channel. Here's another sinuous channel, but it has variability in width. It has point bars, piles of sand on the inside of bends, kind of wider at the bends, uh, multi-channel island braided system, uh, fully braided active braided river in Denali Park, Alaska. So. There's a lot of variability in, in the morphology or configuration of rivers. So why? That's what we, where we want to get to. And again, rivers do uh, important work. They, it's obvious that they drain the landscape, right? When it rains, there's runoff, snow melt. Rivers drain the landscape. But they also transport sediment. When you look at a river like that, that may not be so obvious. Uh, when you look at a, this, the glacial meltwater channel, channel uh, in Alaska, and it's a little more obvious. When you look at this river, you say, yeah, I guess they do transport sediment. It's milky. Uh, there are cobbles and boulders rolling along here. Uh, and through it all, there's ecosystem service. Wildlife, fish, uh, invertebrates come to rely on rivers. And many of them, many of them are uniquely tied to certain uh, riverine habitat, as, as we'll see. And again, just another, this is a, a multi-channel. Here's an example of a braided river as well. And it's easier when you look at a river like that to say, oh, yeah, they, they transport sediment. And uh, when you work in these rivers, you're getting hit in the feet with things like this and larger. Uh, it's, it, it's rather uh, obvious that, uh, that coarse material rolls and bounces along the bed of, of the channel. Um, so that's the job of a river. Now, in a natural system, um, you, you get a balance established in a river between the hydrologic regime, which is determined by the climate and, and the geology of the landscape, the sediment load, which is also determined by the landscape, um, and the channel pattern. So the channel pattern will reflect these things, as you'll see. Um, and then fish and wildlife are going to adjust and use habitat that's suitable to them. Uh, and again, uh, certain animals uh, prefer rivers of this sort to rivers, say, similar to the Delaware, the Susquehanna, or or whatever your favorite river is. Okay, so how do they transport this sediment? We break sediment load up into three categories. Uh, one we call the dissolved load or solution load. It's the, it's the material that's dissolved in the water. You really can't see this easily unless it's, there's really a high dissolved load. Uh, it's sort of like the cream in your coffee or the coffee in your water. It just moves with the fluid. Um, Another important way in which sediment is transported is in suspension, and that's material that's held by turbulence up in the water column. And in most systems, that's going to be silt and clay. It's going to be fine-grained material. When you see a muddy river, you're looking at suspended load coloring the water. And then the third category of, of sediment transport or mode is, is what we call bed load. It's, of course, mostly sand and gravel, coarse material, and it rolls, bounces, slides along the bottom, 
And of course, through that abrasion, uh, river cobbles get rounded off. Now, this thing, undoubtedly, this was a metamorphic rock. I know this started in the river, and this was in the Robertson River in Alaska. When this got into the system, it was, it was some sort of um, um, uh, angular class, okay? Probably rectangular in any particular view. Now it's so round, I can't lay it down without it rolling around. Um, so that's how rivers transport sediment. And, and we're going to see that some rivers carry a lot of this, other rivers a lot of that, some a mix, and that's what's going to dictate what a river looks like. Okay? Um, so the sediment load, what, what determines that? The river doesn't get a choice in this. The landscape <coughs> feeds the river water, again, pretty much climate related, and based on the geology, topography, um, the sediment load is also determined by processes happening in the watershed. The river just gets it, okay, and it has to move it. So, for example, if you have a steep mountainous landscape, um, that's going to probably deliver fairly large quantities of coarse sediment in the form of sand and gravel. Um, here's, some, here's landscapes in New Zealand. You see mass movements, landslides are, are prominent. The river is so filled with sediment that they have to come in and, and try to clear it out occasionally. Uh, another example from New Zealand, you see lands, this place is coming apart, you know, big steep mountainous landscape, seismic shaking once in a while, and so the rivers are just delivered a lot of coarse material, and they're going to have to transport it. Now, of course, because you have a mountain range here, they're going to have the advantage of a steep regional slope to work with, okay, to energize them. Um, if you have a glacial uh, meltwater channel, um, you're going to typically have a lot of coarse material. Glaciers are just conveyor belts. It's dumping sediment, coarse stuff uh, at, at their snout, and the rivers have to deal with it. This is actually, I just realized, this. there are two people in orange here. Uh, this was in New Zealand, January 2000, and what is this, 10, so 8, 9, 2009. And uh, that fresh-looking rock, or fresh-looking glacier right there is laying there, and there's a fella underneath that ice, um, and his brother was killed as well. So two, two tourists were killed. Uh, in that ice fall there, and these guys were monitoring it, so they were waiting to, for the other body to wash out, which happened a couple weeks later. Um, but glaciers are pretty active environments. You don't want to be fooling around in, in the front of a, of a glacier uh, under a lot of pressure. Um, what if you have a low relief, meaning a, a, a topographically, uh, um, relief is the, dis is the change in elevation from the lowest point in the landscape to the highest. So high relief would be a mountainous area, Low relief would be the Midwest. Uh, and in that landscape, typically for a lot of reasons, the, the rivers are mostly going to get a lot of silt and clay delivered to them. I have agriculture pictures here, um, but just to convey the image that uh, landscape erosion is going to bring a lot of fine grain material to, to, the, to those drainage networks. So rivers get this stuff from the landscape. They got to move it. Where do they get their energy? Okay, I think uh, sort of giving you the clues, right? Discharge which is the volume of water per unit time. That's going to be a climate-controlled variable largely. And channel slope or gradient. Steeper the slope, more energy the channel has. So there's a lot of, I could lace this lecture full of quantitative relationships. I'm not going to. It's really going to do, we're trying to do about a course worth of material in an hour and a half. Um, so I'm going to gloss over a lot of things, but I do want to get a couple, couple terms in your head. Uh, one is something that we call total stream power, and we use the symbol omega to, to, um, to symbolize that. And it really just consists of these parameters and one more. Uh, there's the equation. It's just discharge times gradient, and the gamma there means specific weight of water. So the weight per unit volume of water times the discharge, which is the volume of water flowing past the point per unit time, times the slope. Is, is a way of summarizing the total energy of a river at a, at a location. So we go stand at the Delaware River and look at it, and we can measure the slope, measure the discharge, plug in the specific weight of water. If we measure its temperature, get it out of a table, and uh, we can calculate the total energy of that river at that point at that moment. Okay? So omega here for us, just remember, that's going to be stream power. And it's a measure of transport capacity. Obviously, the more stream power, more energy for sediment transport. Okay? Uh, and we're going to emphasize and focus on that slope parameter quite a bit today. Another way to measure sediment or, or stream power is in terms of shear stress or attractive force. Water's flowing on a, down, down a sloping surface, so if we sort of envision um, you know, a channel bed here covered with cobbles and particles, and this is the water surface, that water exerts a shear stress on the bed of the channel. And that shear stress is the force that can entrain or pick up particles and move them. 
So when we think about shear stress, what we're really measuring is, again, notice slope is in there. It's a specific weight of water times the depth of the water times the slope. So all we need to know is how deep's the water at that point, what's the slope angle in here, know the specific weight, and we can calculate what the shear stress is on the bed of that channel. And that shear stress is going to pick up particles. And really now we're looking at instead of total energy, we're saying, well, what's the force of the water on a unit area of the bed of the channel? Okay? And so again, just another way of talking about energy, fluid energy for sediment transport. Okay? And so when we think about then sediment transport in a river, it's going to be a result of the transport capacity measured typically by uh, stream power um, and sediment availability. What's the, what's the landscape feeding the river? And those two things will dictate uh, what a river has to transport. And all sorts of great stuff will come, will fall out of that, as you'll see. Okay? Just a side note, we all know that discharge fluctuates daily, weekly, monthly, yearly. So you might ask yourself, okay, you're going to try to sell us a story here that that river form reflects function and that the energy of the stream is important in, in determining that. And you say, well, wait a minute, if stream power and water depth and shear stress change, which one forms the channel? A lot of work has shown on most of the world's rivers that the channel forming discharge is something around bank full. Uh, so what do we mean by that? Just that name is barely descriptive, I think. You know, so here's the channel. It might have a water level down there. We're thinking of these as the banks. Where's bank full? Somewhere up around there. And in most rivers, what we see is something around bank full discharge is the one that forms the channel. What's important about that, of course, is to change the channel form river has to mobilize the boundary. If it, can't, if it doesn't have enough shear stress to move a particle, it can't change its shape, right? If that boundary consists of particles, if it can't move them, it, it's, it's just, it, it, it has inherited that channel. So for most low flows, that's what's happening. A river might as well have been a canal constructed by engineers. Uh, the water's just flowing through it. But when you get up to some magical depth, uh, you get to a magical, what we call critical shear stress, when the bed can start to get mobilized, now the river can effectuate change on its channel. Okay? So it's sort of the bank full flow or something about that. Um, uh, you know, discharge varies with time, as I just said. So it's bank full or something around there is the channel forming flow. This channel right at this flow level probably has enough energy. If you were to stand in here, you would be hitting the feet with, with bed load, okay? material rolling along. Go in there fly fishing or fishing on a lower flow day, nothing's happening. The bed's pretty much uh, stable. Okay? So when we talk about, oh, river form is determined by discharge, this is the one that does the work. Okay? okay, let's start just with this statement. Remember, silt and clay, fine grain stuff, that mostly moves in suspension. You get, that, you get silt and clay up into suspension, it can stay there in very low velocities. Now, when you look at a plot like this, it shows suspended load, how much sediment, these are real data, uh, from a particular river at a particular site, and it shows the amount of suspended sediment being transported in tons per day as a function of discharge. Okay? And you look at that right away and say, hey, wait, there's a straight line relationship, pretty good relationship. So uh, discharge determines suspended load, uh, and, and that's because discharge is a measure of the energy through, shear, uh, through um, stream power, et cetera. And then you look carefully and say, wait, log, log, scale. And so, for example, if we say 1,000 cubic feet per second, um, or, or what is this, 1,500 roughly. I want to get to this point here. You say, okay, how much can the river transport? Oh, about 15 tons per day. But you see on other days, uh, with the same discharge, same energy, it's carrying order magnitude more sediment. That's a hell of a big range anywhere vertically in this relationship. What's that tell us? It tells us that suspended load is controlled not so much by the stream's energy, but, 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 what, but by what the landscape gives the stream, okay? The river can carry that much or that much. What the, what's the difference between that moment and that moment or anywhere in between? What happened in the watershed? How much fine grain stuff got washed in? Rivers can transport suspended load easily. So they almost always have sufficient transport capacity to carry that fine stuff. And we often say that load is, is supply limited. How much does a river carry? Depends on how much the landscape feeds it. Okay? And this, we're, you know, this is a little building block here for the whole story. So store that one. So we call it su supply limited. This muddy water, uh, if when the rainfall ends, this stream will probably drop in flow level a little bit and go perfectly clear. 
Uh, all this fine grain stuff will wash through. Why is it carrying a lot of fine grain stuff here? There was a storm event, a lot of soil particles were detached and fed to the stream. This coarse stuff is not supply limited. There's plenty of that around. The stream's energy level is more directly going to dictate when and how often this big stuff moves. Okay? So we call it su supply limit. Here's a great example. You watch a tributary where there was rainfall coming into another channel and you see this mud plume, this fine grain suspended load coming through here. This river has much less suspended load. Is it, do you, you don't imagine, I know for an instant, that, because you're, you're, this is an alumni event, you're Lafayette graduates, so I know, that's why I can assume you guys are sharp. Um, so, so you're, you're, you know, you're not going to spend a millisecond um, questioning or thinking that, oh, this river's carrying more suspended load because it has more power than this one. No, it's because this drainage had a rainfall event that washed a lot of fine grain material into it. There, there, the stream power probably at that, or say shear stress there, or stream power, whatever you want to measure for a segment of channel versus this side, probably exactly the same. The difference is this one got fed a big slug of fine grain material, it's carrying it. Um, so rivers can, they have an easy time carrying the fine grain load in most cases. Okay? So let's stop and take stock where we are. Uh, we, we know now that rivers have to transport the available load and they can do that within the constraints of the available energy. The, the big discharge events, the, the bank full flow and slope will determine that. And um, hopefully that data convince you that fine grain load, pff, easy work for a river. Okay. okay, let's start looking at morphology of channels. And we're going to tie that fine grain load into some of this story. All of these channels have the same cross-sectional area. Okay. But again, you wouldn't consider them having the same geometry. They have very different widths, very different depths, and to compare the shape of a channel, we want to take the width and the depth and combine them into something that we'd call the width-depth ratio. Okay? So a channel like that would have, uh, it's wide and shallow. So is that a high width-depth ratio or low? High, right? That's a high width-depth ratio. This one here, same cross-sectional area, but Narrow and deep, low width depth ratio. So when we talk about cross-sectional form, this is our currency, width depth ratio. Okay? Because you can compare the Bushkill's geometry, the little Bushkill Creek at the bottom of the hill, to the Mississippi. If you use these terms, Mississippi's obviously much wider, much deeper. But if we compare their width depth, uh, and this is going to be an impossibility, but I'm going to give it a shot. I'm going to draw two channels with the same width depth of different size. I'm going to attempt to. Okay? Um, conceptually, those two might have the same cross-sectional form, right? They look fairly similar. This one's much wider, much deeper, but if we took the width by the depth and the width by the depth, we'd hopefully, if I did a decent job, come up with the same answer, okay? So that's what we mean by this uh, width-depth ratio. All it means is, is it wide and shallow, narrow and deep, something in between. Um, so what controls it? It's largely bank cohesion. The sediment in the banks of a river are going to reflect what it transports century in, century out, millennia in, millennia out. So if a river is carrying a lot of silt and clay and not much sand and gravel, its boundaries, the sediment around here, mostly going to be consisting of fine grain material, silt and clay. Okay? So if the banks are cohesive, they tend to make, uh, can maintain relatively vertical um, geometries. So if you have a system with cohesive banks, you have a much greater chance of having a channel that's narrow and deep than wide and shallow. Okay. Um, and where's the cohesion come from? Silt and clay is, is one of the primary sources of, of material cohesion. Okay. So if there's a lot of silt and clay, banks will probably be cohesive. Vegetation provides cohesion, but to a lesser extent. Um, here's a good example. These banks are failing, these trees are falling in the river even though they're, the banks are vegetated. Uh, if the erosion is getting under the root wads, the, the vegetation is not going to be very effective. Now, of course, if the, root, if the banks were entirely vegetated, um, then that vegetation can indeed provide some cohesion. Okay? So these are, these are the sources of cohesion. We'll mostly emphasize this component. So some work way back in 1960 um, by Stan Shum uh, shows that he, he noticed this. You know, I think there's a relationship between bank cohesion and um, width depth ratio or geometry of channels. So he went around uh, the, the, the west in the uh, foothills of the Rockies and out onto the plains and measured the width depth of a whole bunch of channels and then took samples of the material in the banks 
said, okay, what's the percentage of silt and clay? And you see a pretty strong relationship here. Again, there's scatter, um, but as, as um, the percentage of silt and clay in the, ba in the banks increases, uh, goes in height, the, the, um, the channels get narrow and deeper, right? So wide and shallow with low silt and clay, um, narrow and deep with a lot of silt and clay. So you know this from looking at rivers. Um, this is the, uh, what is this, Little Missouri in Montana, and it has relatively steep banks. It has a low width-depth ratio. Why? It's mostly silt and clay in here and a little bit of sand. Um, another river, this is in Kansas, a tributary to the Smoky Hill River, and again, relatively uh, narrow and relatively deep and jam-packed with silt and clay. Um, and then some years later, he was with the Geological Survey there, went to Colorado State and had his first Ph.D. student, and they did in a flume experimental work and, and increased the amount of bed load, the opposite of silt and clay. Now we're saying, what if we have a lot of coarse material moving as bed load? And they see that rivers that carry a lot of coarse materials bed load tend to be um, wide and shallow as opposed to narrow and deep, right? So the sediment supply is going to dictate the channel geometry, okay? Uh, flip side of that coin, if you get to a river like this, this, this it's very hard to get the scale on this. When you're looking at these are tree trunks here. Uh, that river is almost a mile wide. This is the uh, Robertson River. That's the Alaska Range in Alaska. Notice a couple of things. Um, this is a braided river. It's wide and shallow. Um, I worked on this river for a month. A student and I walked across this river every single day. Deepest we ever got was chest deep. That was more swimming because you'd get washed downstream uh, in, in that case. Um, but this river, you, you can walk across here. We carried survey equipment in here. No worries about getting it wet um, because the channel was knee deep. And, and, Steep, you can only think, see the slope, we're getting hit in the feet with cobbles. Uh, high energy, but very wide and shallow. And what's the vegetation, all this woody debris telling us? That's an indication that, I mean, where is it coming from? It's coming from the banks being eroded and trees tumbling into the river. So you'll see on a lot of the braided river slides I'll show you, you'll see a lot of woody debris. Um, and the, these are bed load dominated channels, very little silt and clay in the banks, very little cohesion. The river will spread out and generate a wide, shallow cross-sectional geometry. This is further down the Alaska Range of Gersel River. There's a student and myself for scale. And again, you, you see this debris all over, trees uh, laying around. We'd watch trees uh, rolling and, and ripping down through these channels every day. Okay? So we're seeing a relationship here between cross-sectional shape and sediment load. What's the river carry? Dictates how cohesive the banks are dictates whether you have wide, shallow, or narrow and deep. Okay? So taking stock again, we know they got to transport the sediment load with the available energy. Silt and clay is a cakewalk for a river. We're going to come back to that in a minute when we start talking about river slope. Um, and cross-sectional forms a function of sediment load and bank cohesion. Okay? And so there's our sort of summary statement to that effect. Okay, let's look at the longitudinal component of a river, okay? the slope. Now, rivers can't adjust their slope. They're going to always be limited by the regional topography, right? Maximum slope will be dictated by the relief. Um, you can imagine rivers in the Rocky Mountains could be quite steep. Rivers on the, you know, in Illinois, bigger challenge, right? Now, rivers can change their slope. How? We, and every one of you knows this. It's so intuitive. Does anybody ski? Anybody ever ride a bicycle? You know how to change slope, right? First time you got the training wheels off, you, you knew intuitively how to change the slope of your path. You were climbing a steep hill, steeper than you'd like. What do you do to change? How do you make that steep slope gentler? Yeah, you take a sinuous path, right? Rivers can do that. Rivers can change their gradient, you know, or if you're skiing down a mountain, Right? Probably the only time you ever ski straight down slope was when you're on the so-called bunny slopes when you're just learning how, right? Once you start going to real ski resorts, if you, you know, that, that's suicide. You know, straight down, I, I always think that. When I go to these alpine environments and I see these ski slopes, I'm thinking, why would you, you know, who can ski down that, you know? Um, they do it by slaloming, right? By cutting back and forth. So you're extending the path length from point A to point B, and reducing the gradient, uh, whether it's going downhill or whether it's going uphill. So rivers um, can change their gradient by becoming more sinuous. Okay? Now most rivers do have this 
longitudinal profile that's, con that's concave up. Um, but within any stretch of a river, a river you know, can meander more, uh, and that will cut its gradient across the regional gradient. If it goes straight line path, it's going at maximum slope. Okay? Now, uh, we measure this in terms of sinuosity. Use a symbol P, it's very simple. Right? <coughs> What's the sinuosity of a river? It's the length of the channel over the length of the valley. So if we were to um, if we were to imagine a river valley, these are the boundaries of the valley. We're looking down on it in plan view. And let's say the river has this course or path, then to, to measure the sinuosity, we would measure the path of the river just like we would measure the path of a skier or the path of a child riding uphill on a bicycle as the length of the channel. And then we would just measure the length of the valley straight down the, the valley. And so that ratio is sinuosity, right? The minimum that it could be is one. A straight river would have a sinuosity of one. And with every curve or meander, that length of the channel increases. So sinuosity is just measures length of the channel over length of the valley. I won't do the algebra for you, but it's very simple. It's also the slope of the valley the direct straight line slope over the slope of the channel through the meandering course will give you the same result. Okay? What I want you to take away from this is the recognition then that uh, sinuosity, by becoming sinuous, a river is cutting its gradient. It's, it's, it's reducing its energy. Okay? So sinuosity is one of the measures of what a river looks like in plan view. These are just two, straight, two lines meant to illustrate river patterns. That river would be perfectly straight. It would have a sinuosity of one, a steep gradient. This river going down the same regional gradient, if it doubles its path length, it would have a sinuosity of two and a lower gradient. Okay? So when a river meanders, it's reducing the energy that it could potentially have. Right? Its, its maximum slope is the straight line course. Anything less, re, any path that's longer reduces its energy. Okay? And I think you also probably have recognized, looking at rivers, been in airplanes, looked down, this tendency to meander is universal, right? You rarely, I mean, I, I look at rivers, and I, I, I'm hard-pressed to come up with examples of that pattern. Straight line means there's a fault controlling it, a fracture, or it's flowing across what used to be an old lake bed, and it doesn't have a chance to meander because it, would, it wouldn't have any slope if it did. Uh, so most rivers have some tendency to meander, okay? And this just shows, just to give you a sense of this, a bunch of rivers, each rational river course is map, drawn off of a map um, by Shum, who looked at sinuosity as well um, as a measure of channel form. And so here's a river with a sinuosity of 2.09. It has a, a relatively low gradient compared to some of these others. These rivers were all flowing pretty much across the same regional gradient. So the more sinuous, the lower the gradient, the more close to a straight line, the steeper gradient within the constraints of the region, the, the constraints of the of the ski slope, so to speak. Okay? So here's the conundrum, right? If a channel becomes more sinuous, it reduces its slope and it's losing, it's giving up energy. Okay? It's losing energy. So that reduces, we know that stream power, shear stress, both have that S term in them. They both have slope in them. So if a river gets sinuous, its slope goes down, it has less total stream power, it has less shear stress. Okay? And if, if that shear, if that slope becomes insufficient to transport the load, the river's not getting its job done. Okay? It can't maintain its job of transporting its sediment load if it gets too sinuous. There are feedback mechanisms in rivers that'll, that they get too sinuous, sediment will start to pile up in them, and they'll straighten out. Okay? So let's take a look at that. Um, rivers, be, as they become sinuous through time, they often go through an episode where they'll go through what we call an avulsion or a cutoff. And then it leaves a channel here um, as, as an oxbow lake that will eventually fill in. And the channel's now back to a shorter course. Okay? Now, all sinuous rivers, meandering rivers, go through periods of, of cutoffs here and there and, and, and so forth. But at the whole channel scale length, um, the frequency with which this happens will often be controlled by whether or not becoming sinuous makes it impossible for a river to get the job done and transport sediment. I'll show you how here in a second. Here's an example of a river that's carrying both coarse material and fine material, and it obviously got sinuous and the channel was cut off. 
But what happens here, if the channel starts to get too sinuous and slope drops, more sediment will pile up in the bed of the channel if it has a lot of coarse load. And that will, during a high flow event, reduce the channel capacity. If the channel has sediment piled in it now, all of a sudden, this is all sediment. The next, what was used to be a bank full flow that used to be contained in the river, won't be able to be contained in the river. And that flow is going to jump over bank, cross the floodplain, and facilitate a cutoff. So if the river, and this is the big if, if a river has a lot of coarse material, that coarse material accumulating when the river gets too gentle and gradient will cause it to cut off meanders and keep it from getting highly sinuous. Okay? And going back again to paper in 1960, we see that there's once again a relationship between silt clay in the banks and sinuosity. A lot of silt and clay, what that means is the river carries a lot of silt and clay and not much sand and gravel. Rivers tend to be more sinuous if they carry a lot of fine grain material. They don't try to do this, um, but what happens is there's just that feedback mechanism in, in them. They get more sinuous. If they have coarse material to pile up, the bends will get cut off more quickly. Um, if there's not a lot of coarse material, suspended load, what I say about suspended loads, that's hard for rivers to carry or easy? Easy. If a river's carrying a lot of, what I often say to students is, you know, why do rivers meander? Because they can. If they carry a lot of fine grain material, they can get highly sinuous and never pay a penalty, so to speak, of not being able to transport their load. If they have a lot of coarse material, they, they, they can't maintain a highly sinuous course. Okay? Now, taking stock then, we're saying they got to get the job done. <clears throat> they can, here's the big key. They can transport silt and clay with low slope and stream power. Um, Cross-sectional forms related to that, we know that, and we come... Uh, back to the, um, to, the, uh, to the sinuosity component, the plan view component, as a river becomes more sinuous, their gradients are reduced, but if the river is suspended load dominated, they can be sinuous and still have enough energy to carry the sediment load. Okay? So um, rivers that are dominated by fine grain material can get extremely sinuous. And, and you don't see point bars in here. There's not evidence in this channel of sand and gravel transport. This river is carrying mostly silt and clay. So it will, care, it will establish a very sinuous course, narrow and deep. Uh, we're starting to see things come together in three dimensions, right? Um, and just a note on meandering. You know, this is a great question. Why do rivers meander? It's a complicated answer, but in a nutshell, it's because water doesn't just move directly down channel. It's, they're a spiral, uh, in fact, fairly organized, uh, sec what we call secondary currents in circulation, and that will uh, facilitate meandering. You get changes in the velocity, more higher velocity on the outside of bends. It crosses over the high velocity uh, profile here, and then back to this side, and so you see a maximum velocity moving from the outside of a bend to the middle to the outside. People have, uh, go this is uh, actually not Albert Einstein, although he did write a paper. Yeah, it's his son. Hans Albert Einstein is Albert Einstein's son, so this is Hans Albert's work. Uh, and, but Einstein Sr. actually published a paper on river meandering uh, as well. But Einstein and Shen have a model here for secondary circulation. Thompson suggested that uh, there could be more than just two secondary circulation cells. But uh, just the, the thing to accept here, because again, we just don't have the time. This is a full, hour, a full hour lecture to talk about secondary circulation, the development of meanders. But if you just accept it as an inherent tendency of flowing water, th uh, that's good enough for our purposes. And what we're saying, though, is that, OK, we'll take it as a given. Rivers have a tendency to meander. They will meander. But the feedback mechanism that will limit the degree to which they meander will be whether or not they can meander and still carry the sediment load, okay? All right, let's look at this in plan view 3D, and, and we'll wrap this morphology up and look at braided rivers, and then it's going to get real excited, exciting. No, that was just before you'd slip. It's going to get real excited. I'm the it. Um, I can't help but get excited about these rivers. They're so energetic. They're, they're, they're just, you get, next time you have a chance, get near a braided river, just go there and listen, and you'll hear, you'll hear bed load rolling, bouncing, sliding on the bed go out in there, it, they're, they're awesome rivers. Um, but what we look at a slide like this, you're like, oh my God, it'll take this guy four hours to explain this variability. Yeah, rivers do have a lot of variability in their plan view geometry, uh, but let's simplify it. Um, this is uh, from, uh, I actually have 
copies of this to pass around and there's a whole this is the, the bare skeleton component and then you'll when you get this you'll see there's a lot of information around the margins just pass them around somewhere in the middle here uh, we'll get closure and uh, let's just look at this spectrum okay and say well there's a spectrum of channel morphologies here from highly sinuous narrow and deep less sinuous getting a little bit wider and shallow less sinuous still much wider and shallower and a few bars in the island or, or, or bars in the channel and then this is a fully braided channel wide shallow not very sinuous braid bars all over the place okay so we're just going to look at that spectrum um, and this was uh, some work uh, of, of uh, this guy Shum again um, I, I sort of I would never say he was my PhD advisor so I shouldn't like this guy um, wonderful man uh, so we can look at that spectrum, right? Look at that. That's a highly sinuous river, narrow and deep, relatively constant width wherever you look at the river. Uh, this one's sinuous but wider with point bars. And so you say, ah, I don't see any sand in this system. It's probably mostly silt and clay. This one's carrying some sand, okay? Um, here's one which we'd call island braided. There's a few islands in the channel. That's the Allegheny River in western PA. And then here's a fully braided river, okay? And so you look at this diagram, this sum summarizes everything. Um, their main control here is this. These rivers at this side of the screen are suspended load dominated. The rivers over here, bed load dominated. These guys here, something in between, okay, what we'd call mixed load dominated. Um, width depth ratio, high width depth ratio, low width depth ratio up here. Um, sediment load, large sediment load over here. Um, Large material, large quantity, high velocities, high stream power. What that means is high slope. Okay? So these rivers tend to be steep and have a lot of stream power because of it. These tend to have less stream power, um, low slope, and on top of that, they're, they're reducing their slope even more by being highly sinuous. This is a great summary diagram. Um, this will be on the test. Um, <laughs> but but this, this pulls all of this together for you. Okay? So if we take stock, now we're getting, this is old hat, right? They got to transport the load within the constraints of available energy. Um, they can get away. If they only carry silt and clay, they can, silt and clay, they can meander all over the place, no problem. Um, if they have a lot of silt and clay, they're going to probably be narrow and deep. Um, if they get more sinuous, they reduce their gradient. As long as they're just suspended load dominated, pff, no problem. Water off a duck's back. Um, and so we come away with the conclusion, now a pretty grand conclusion, that channel form reflects sediment load and um, stream power, right? What's the nature of the load? How big are the particles? How much? Uh, what's the regional slope the river's working with? And that dictates whether you have a river that looks like that, like that, something in between, okay? Pretty sweet. And just to point out, yeah, we can, we can quantify this stuff you know, suspended load dominated channels. If we look at slope versus grain size to, to uh, depth to grain size ratios, and they, they plot out in different fields. So you can quant, all I'm showing you is where I say, look, we can quantify this stuff. It's not just observational. Yes, sir. What's the impact of climate change on these areas? Great, great question. And, and the Platte River is a good example of that. If, so you're just taking it the logical next step. If a river can be in equilibrium between the controlling variables and its morphology, if climate change changes discharge, vegetation distribution, and sediment delivery, channels can change. Uh, rivers have changed. If, if you guys would have just gone to school here 18,000 years ago, that'd be some serious <laughs> alumni action, right? <laughs> um, but if we could have, you know, if we were all here, I'd, 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 whatever your eye teeth are, I'd give them um, to be here 18,000 years ago. Because 18,000 years ago, some of you told me you had Jim Dyson. Uh, there was an ice margin right up here. There was a glacier crossing the river right in Belvedere, right? Ten miles up the road here, there was a glacier. The Delaware River was a braided river. The whole city, of, there were, it was a multi-channel, fully braided river then. Climate change, sediment load decreased, dish, didn't have that glacier feeding its sediment anymore, lost that annual meltwater slug, and that river's turned over to, um, to this. Okay, it used to look like this, it's looking more like this under the current climate regime. So yes, climate change can change a river morphology. The example I'll show you, anthropogenic human activities can change a river's morphology. And this actually is a good moment to pop this slide up here again. There's actually, I just thought of a way to use this. These are sort of stability envelopes. 
anywhere near these curves, you're kind of, you're, you're, the boundaries between these, you're kind of at threshold zones. These rivers are more sensitive to, to climate change or land use change than, say, this one. So say you had a mixed load channel there versus that one. That guy can be jumping to suspended load or to a more sinuous channel pretty easily. The, near the boundaries, you're, you're more sensitive to disturbance and, um, and, and can uh, change to another channel uh, form. Okay. So, yeah, that's a great question, that's, and that's a, a consideration. Um, <coughs> all right, let's look at fully braided rivers. Yes, sir. Going back to canoeing and the pines. Mm -hmm. uh, very meandering in there. Seems like it's fat as a pancake. But as you go from point A to point B, there's a decrease in the, the, the grade goes there, right? Okay. And in order for the water to get from A to B, it has to go faster because it has a bigger loop to cover. Well, it, it wouldn't have to maintain that continuity of, of, of getting there at a certain time, right? I'm, I'm not sure if I'm following you right. If it's going to go from point A to point B, let's say it's right. you know, five, five feet low. Okay, right, right. 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 In order to get there, it has to, it has to go maybe five times as far to get there. And right. it seems as if that means that the velocity of the water is a great deal more than other ones. That becomes important when there is a lot of water in the ponds because it overflows the banks. The next thing you know, you're fighting your way through the, through the trees. Right, but it doesn't have to maintain a certain velocity to get, I mean, it will have l a lower velocity if it becomes more sinuous because the slope will decrease, it will be moving slower. The more sinuous the channel becomes, if discharge stays the same, all things being equal, it would be, at a, if we had two channels with the same discharge um, and one was more sinuous than the other, the velocity would be lower because velocity, there's another equation, a Manning equation, that relates, velocity is related to slope as well directly related to slope. So as, as slope goes down, velocity would go down, all things being equal. Okay. We could talk about it m more, yeah. yeah. Okay, so let's look at fully braided rivers. These are sand and gravel bed load dominated rivers. They have high gradients, high width depth ratios, uh, a heavy meaning a large quantity of coarse material. Now this is a statement that seems uh, counterintuitive after everything else I've emphasized fine grain material. Some of these rivers will carry a lot of suspended load. What I'm saying about its irrelevance is because these rivers have high slopes, they can carry large quantities of spin load. They're often muddy, dirt, dirty rivers, uh, but that stuff just washes right through the river. It doesn't accumulate in the banks, and so it doesn't. These rivers will be sandy banked and sand and gravel bedded. Even though the rivers carry a lot of fine material, they don't deposit them in the channel. They'll wash that stuff, will go right downstream. So that suspended load won't have much influence on channel morphology or bank cohesion. Uh, one of the fun things on, on these rivers is sometimes, and I, and I don't know, I guess in those days I was shooting film cameras, no videos, but there were a couple different occasions. We were camping on the, on the banks of these rivers, and channel would sweep over into the forest, and, and we'd just hear trees crashing, and you'd get to watch trees falling in the river, sometimes for hours at a time, wake you up at night uh, sometimes as well. Uh, so those banks just don't have cohesion. Look how muddy that water is, but that mud isn't being deposited in large quantities in the Gersel River. It's going right down to the Tanana and out to the Yukon. Okay? So it doesn't influence the cohesiveness of these banks, even though it's carrying a lot of it. The thing that's controlling the, the channel form is the fact it has high energy and a lot of coarse material. Okay? So where do we see braided rivers? No accident, right? I keep showing you mountain scenes, glacial meltwater channels. You get in a mountain, this is a satellite image, you get in a mountainous landscape, braided river, get to the snout of a glacier, there are multiple channels coming off of this, off of this glacier. Downstream, you know, literally, if I had to turn around, take a picture, multiple channels, okay? So what's conducive to braiding? Abundant coarse load, sand and gravel, non-cohesive <coughs> erodible banks, steep gradient, fluctuating discharge helps the process of braiding, as you'll see uh, in, in a minute. Um, uh, so glacial systems are particularly, uh, particularly suited to generate braided rivers. And you might not know what you're looking at here, but I'll show you, tell you, that's the Malaspina Glacier, that white stuff that's sort of mixing in with the clouds and the sky is a glacier. This is the edge of the glacier, 
And we look at, and, and these are glacial moraines, deposits, this glaciers dumping piles of coarse material, meltwater, and you see a braided river coming away from it. This is in Alaska, the south coast of Alaska. Southeast, uh, not the panhandle, but southeast portion. Um, so those are the factors that are conducive to, to, to braiding, and, and uh, you'll see where the, where the fluctuating discharge comes in. Now here's a, one take, if you don't remember anything, remember this, but you'll remember more than anything. You'll remember a lot here. People, I look at book after book, especially intro books. Braided rivers are overloaded. Rivers that are overloaded with sediment are braided. Not necessarily. If you overload a river and it's piling up sediment, it'll probably be braided. But they can be equilibrium channels. I did this over and over again for three years. I made braided channels where I would control, I'm looking downstream here in the flume, I would control how much sediment was going into the channel with the hopper. And you know, if you go to the, our flume in the building at five o'clock here, we have an optional trip over there. You'll see what, these, it's, it's a grain hopper. We modified the feed sediment. I would set that thing in this flume so I was feeding this channel a certain amount of sediment. I'd go down here out of the tail box with a screen and catch the sediment coming out and adjust everything so what was going in was matched by what was coming out. So in terms of sediment load, this channel was in perfect equilibrium. It was not building up the bed because it couldn't carry sediment through. It was not down cutting because it had excess energy and, and, and grabbing sediment from the bed. Uh, many braided rivers have been braided for millennia. Okay? Uh, it's a stable pattern. It's, it can be an equilibrium stable pattern. I also cause these rivers to down cut. And, and they can down cut and still maintain a, a braided pattern. So they're not necessarily overloaded. Um, and I hate when I get kids in earth surface processes after they've had some intro book and I have to, I have to unteach that idea that they're, because they read in that book, oh, they're overloaded with sediment. They have a lot of sediment. They have an abundance, of course, uh, material, but they're not necessarily overloaded. Okay? They can be an equilibrium channel form. Okay. Um, they can also be underloaded. They can have insufficient sediment um, and can have the ability to transport more than it's coming in and they'll down cut. Now, there's a threshold there. At some point, they're not going to have enough sediment and they'll change over to a single thread channel. Okay, okay. Um, bars. Now again, you know, a lot of you are thinking this, um, but no, um, that's now the spot. The college owns this building at the bottom of the hill, but it used to be called Max's Bar. I used to always look at that and say, man, that looks like a good place to get beat up. Um, so it's, it's much better where it is now, I think, as the spot. But uh, when we talk about bars and braided rivers, we're thinking about piles of sediment, accumulation of sediment on the bed. I know, not exciting as these kind of bars necessarily, but uh, in a minute, I think you're going to change. I'm going to change your perspective on that. Okay, so what do we mean by bars? We have a variety of names for bars. Um, I read a paper, it was published in 1971, this guy Norm Smith said, in a non-exhaustive non search of the literature, I tally 32 different names for 32 different types of bars. Um, and, and if you read that literature carefully, you start to realize that they're all slight variations on a very small number of the same theme. And so for our terminology, we're going to consider bars to be of two types. Braid bars, what's the nature of a braid bar? At the moment we're describing it, it's stationary. It's not moving. It's, the stippling is meant to imply it's subaerially exposed. We can walk around, around on it in our sneakers or our leather shoes, not get our feet wet. And it's, what, it's the essence of braiding. It's what separates channels in, or, or rivers into multiple channels. Okay? Lingoid bars, lingoid means tongue-shaped. They're tongue-shaped. Sometimes we use the word lobate. Sometimes we'll call them dunes instead of bars. What's their gig? They are lobate-shaped. They're submerged. Okay, so I'm not showing the stippling, but it's a pile of sediment. If you were walking across that channel, you'd get right to there and you'd trip over that bar, okay? Uh, and it's migrating, okay? It migrates. Um, here's another, here's just using in some, some days we call them dunes, sometimes bars, same thing. Notice also I'm showing flow converging on the backside of this migrating dune or bar and diverging on the downstream side. So these guys, if we were standing here watching them, they'd move, okay? Sediment. Uh, if we looked at them in longitudinal section, in other words, I took a slice right down through there, we would see a feature that has some geometry like this. Sediment rolls up the backside, down the front end, and they will migrate like a ripple or a dune downstream as sediment moves across them. Um, here are some examples. These would be braid bars. You could walk on them. There's a little trenching tool. This is a small little stream in Colorado called Sand Creek. And these little low bait features here 
are a series of little lingoid or lobate bars. And you can actually see, look at the water flowing, con, uh, sort of converging here and diverging when you look at the ripples in the downstream side. Once again, this was like 1985, 86. I didn't have a video camera, but uh, sediment in the flume today, you could see this. Sediment's rolling right off the downstream edge of these bars, and these things are migrating. You stand there, they're moving maybe something on the order of, of inches per hour or something in this channel, but they're migrating. Okay? Um, here's an actual mapped lingoid bar in three dimensions. You can see this in this mesh map that flow converges down the backside tumbles over the front edge, and these, this thing would migrate if we kept remapping it. In Alaska, that was one of the things we were doing up there with the surveying, is we were mapping these things as they migrated, and you might be guessing, these things turn into these things. Lingoid bars turn into braid bars, braid bars turn back into lingoid bars, uh, and we were documenting that process. So here's the Platte River, uh, looking down on the satellite view, aerial infrared, vegetation's red, um, these flows from left to right, you're looking at lingoid bars underwater that are, again, if we could get the satellite to stay there and keep snapping pictures, um, we would see these things are migrating, okay? And they turn into braid bars and vice versa, as you'll see in a minute. This is a ground view looking upstream at lingoid bars, lobate bars washing towards us, okay, in the Platte. Uh, another river in Nebraska. Uh, again, arrow infrared, you see these tongue-shaped bars. These are lingoid bars migrating down the Niobrara River. Um, these are fine gravel and, and sand channels. This is the Niobrara ground view. Once again, you see woody debris laying around, and you see what these things look like as they migrate. Now, in channels like this, there's all kind of excess energy. Shear stress is way greater than what it takes to move the particles. So these channels will be dominated with, with during high flow, lingoid bars everywhere and relatively few braid bars, but, they, but the braid bars will pop up. This is a little creek in, in uh, Arizona called Ash Creek, and you can see these little sand, little fine gravel sheets here, and um, little braid bars that were once pieces of these types of features. Okay? So here the available shear stress, way greater than critical <coughs> shear stress, stuff's just rolling all over the place. You can, you can watch these things migrate. Now if we go to gravel bed channels, uh, this is in Alaska, and here you can see a lingoid bar that's becoming emergent. This part's turning into a braid bar. Um, another one with a surveying uh, rod for scale, there's a bar. It's hard to see through that mud, but there's a lingoid bar there. Now looking downstream, you can see one coming around here, a couple multiple lobes, another lobe here. These things are starting to pop up, turn into braid bars. This used to be a half of a lingoid bar here. And I'll show you a diagram that shows that process. In gravel bed rivers, you'll tend to see lingoid bars in fewer numbers at any given moment. Braid bars dominate the scene, but lingoid bars are turning into braid bars here and there. The one big difference between these two systems is here we have available shear stress closer to what it takes to move this stuff. So these things will only migrate maybe tens of feet, hundreds of feet, and then stall and turn into a braid bar because they're just on the threshold of getting enough sediment transport to maintain their, their existence. In, in Splat River, those bars will migrate for miles in some cases. If you were to just keep snapping pictures, satellite pictures, you can track the same feature moving down the channel. Uh, really incredible. Um, and this geometry facilitates conversion uh, to, a, to a stationary bar. Now here's, um, I'm gonna, I also give you something you want to, if you decide that, you know, this is raise your curiosity a little bit. I have a chapter from a textbook um, and I'll, give them to you here. You can take them and read them tonight if you want or on the plane or sometime. Uh, but here's a, a, a model that shows this process from time one to two to three to four. And so here we have migrating lingoid bars all underwater. And then for whatever reason, typically because this, as they migrate, they build up the margins. They sort of shut themselves off. Bar will quit migrating. Flow will shift off and a piece of it will pop above the surface as a braid bar. Another one coming by can get trapped on, and so they, they, we, we describe this process of how braid bars form as lingoid or lobate bar dissection. They get dissected, they quit migrating and stall, get cut, and then uh, and sometimes we call that lingoid bar conversion and accretion. Accretion means another migrating bar will stick on. They redrew this picture um, uh, for this book, uh, and, and, they, and I'll show you the diagrams we started with. Maybe that's what was, theirs look better than, than mine. Uh, but here is a time one, a migrating bar. Um, 
as it migrates, they build up and maybe the shear stress all of a sudden is insufficient to keep moving that material. So that stuff will pop up above the surface, flow will shift off, and you have a braid bar. Uh, another lingoid bar is moving somewhere else in the system. This, again, this geometry, I hope, helps you see how that process happens. Uh, as these things build up, as they migrate, um, there's the flow depth above them is decreasing. Shear stress is equal to slope times depth. So if they're building up, they're, more water is shoaling off of them, and they're reducing the shear stress above them. Inadvertently, they don't mean to, but that's just what happens. And so a piece of it will remain, and this will all get washed away, maybe get reorganized in another bar downstream with some other sediment and keep migrating, and this stuff will be sitting there as a former migrating bar. It's now a piece of braid bar. Okay? And so to get back in the sequence, so say that bar is laying there, another lingoid bar comes cruising by, that might be producing some friction for it, so that side uh, stalls, flow shifts away, and now we have pieces of these things accreting together to build a braid bar complex. Once you see this cartoon and then look at braided rivers, you can see these fragments, I think, all over the place. This is that, I showed you this one earlier, that's a whole piece of bar popping above, above the surface. But when I look at this, I say, wow, there was one here that wrapped around here. Um, if we look at the uh, Platte River, you can see a piece of a bar, you know, the original piece was probably right there. Another one got stuck on, another one, and they're all fragments and they accrete together to form uh, a more complex braid bar. This is a time series photos of a multi-lobed set of lingoid bars. Water's flowing off of that downstream edge and side of a big bar that wraps around. And we look at it a little bit later, you can start to see some of these guys popping up a little bit. You can see this margin a little bit more clearly. And now look at it, this is the next day. Um, it has, this sediment has migrated, this thing has moved. But now you look at it, and we wouldn't call it a lingoid bar, we'd call that a braid bar. It's a pile of sediment sitting up above the surface. And all of these braid bars are fragments of what were formerly migrating bars. Okay? And then another day later, and you can see these things uh, situated above the surface. Looking downstream, here's where fluctuating discharge comes in too. If you have discharge fluctuating overnight, because the glacier's not melting as much in the middle of the night, discharge drops, that'll cause these things that are migrating to just stop and turn into a braid bar. So looking downstream from the Alcan Highway Bridge, you can, I can see here a big dune migrating there and another one wrapping around here. Look at it again a little bit later. Look at it yet again as discharge drops and now we can see these things and they're emerging as braid bars. Okay? So they, they will go back and forth. A week later, this stuff probably wasn't here. That braid bar probably got remobilized, moved away. It was underwater and these things are highly dynamic. These rivers change from day to day uh, week to week completely. And again, where do we see them? Wherever you have glaciers feeding a lot of coarse material or mountain systems, this is coming off the Himalayas. Um, and these two are, are in Alaska, Mendenhall Glacier and then the Gersel River. Okay, so you get mountains, you get braided rivers. Okay, we know the story, right? Yes. I'm, I'm a liberal arts major, so okay. I'm having a hard time. Okay. But it seems to me you're drawing diagrams of these braided rivers, and they all look narrower channels. And then every time you show a picture, they're incredibly shallow and broad. Right. And I, I don't, I'm having a disconnect between the diagrams and the actual pictures. Oh, okay. Are both no, braided rivers very shallow and broad? Right. Very much so. These okay. figures here, if these are the diagrams, are you talking about the bar forming diagrams? Like yeah, these? these okay. a, and then you have a channel marker, and it looks like it's a really narrow river, and the barge is really big, and I'm not, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to... <laughs> To that's not the channel. Th this is just a piece no, of a, a this is just a single that's example right. of one. Right. Okay. But there are other pictures where you have the channel. Okay. Drawn. And so I'm but whenever I see a in, diagram, it doesn't connect with the picture. See, in, in these pictures here, I'm calling and here I have to be careful. There are multiple channels but the entire river would have that width, okay? So right. each of well, these I bars are scaled to each of, these, of e to each of these channels. They'll always be about the same scale as the channel that contains them. And it's really remarkable. In these little channels here, you could see there are oftentimes tiny little lingoid bars in a small channel like that. So the bars themselves will scale to the channels that produce them. just by the nature of having these bars, they've got to be fairly shallow if they're coming out of the water. 
Right. right. You don't have bars. But now. but but they you wouldn't. Really but they wouldn't form. Oh, I mean, there's another. A lot of it, these bars scale to the channel in a lot of ways. Even the the heights of them scale to the depths. They range from in little sand bed channels, this kind of amplitude, to in this case maybe about a foot or so. I've been in channels where the channels are a bit deeper and they're, they're three feet. Yeah, sometimes three feet in, in depth. I lost two cameras because of that. Um, I, I had two cameras in the backpack. I stepped off of a submerged bar that was underwater that was knee deep, and I went into a channel that uh, was about four feet deep. That bar was about three feet in amplitude, and I had a backpack full of sand that we had caught in bed load samplers and two cameras, and I, like a turtle, I guess, I mean, I hit that water and that weight just flipped me and the river was moving and I drench those two channels. So they, they do scale to greater depths. Yeah. Yes, sir. How do you measure the sediment load when you're on the site? You go use that Heli Smith bed load sample. What it has is an open flange. It flanges out to a net sack. And you, you lower that on the bed, and you, you, you have a watch, stopwatch. You keep it on the bed for a minute or so, pull it up, take it back, dump the sediment on a plastic sheet of plastic and just keep doing that at, at different places across channels as quick as you can. We put a little surveying bicycle prisms actually, reflectors on the sampler so when I would be out bed load sampling, a student sitting there with a total station survey equipment shooting me, shooting my locations, then we could create a map of where we collected uh, data. And so you have to move fairly quickly across the channel because it changes through time. Um, is that it, in, the, in the mesh sack on the back of the Heli Smith. The Heli Smith is just a name of a sampler that basically in cross-section, it kind of looks like a box that flanges like this, and, on the, and I'll never draw this well, but this is a mesh sack, so water can flow through here and out the sack, but the sack's coarse enough to trap sediment. Now, for the hydrodynamics of these things, they're actually fairly carefully designed. They're narrower, it flows this way, and the sack is back here. That geometry change keeps it so that water moving through this mesh doesn't create a back pressure and cause water to flow around it. Pretty well designed and you should never leave it on the bed until you get, you know, you get about 30 percent of the bag fill, now you've changed the dynamics of flow. So how long you keep it on the bed will be determined by how much sediment's moving. So, yeah, they, the USGS, USG Logic Survey, they lower these things. I've seen monster ones. They lower off of bridges in the Toodle River in Washington and um, pretty incredible operation off of trucks, like off of a tow truck with cables. Um, so it, it is tough to get data of that sort in a river like this. Okay, so we looked at those, uh, the process of braided river, of how bars form. Um, this we've been through several times, um, so that's old news. And so now we're saying um, you're going to have, if you have a really bed load dominated channel, it'll be steep, low sinuosity, wide and shallow, and braided. And we know braid bar dynamics take home message. Lingoid bars turn into braid bars. Braid bars turn back into lingoid bars. Lingoid bars turn back into braid bars. And this is happening all over the channel, all over the, the river at various times. Right here, braid bars turning into a lingoid bar. Over there in that channel, maybe a lingoid bar has stopped migrating, turning into a braid bar. So that's why we've looked at that diagram. These rivers are described as unstable. They're, they're, the channel is shifting all over the place. Why I find them really extremely fascinating, frankly. Does a braid bar become an island? Yes, if, and that's the problem in the Platte, okay? The Platte River, okay? Yeah, I know. I, I, I introduced myself as I saw on the list of, of names. Um, yes, here, here we go. That's an island there, okay? They get vegetated. They can turn into islands and be stable. And they, become stable. they can become stable. Yeah. Yeah. Where's that one? Delaware. That would, yeah, that would have, those, some of these, those are a little bit more tricky. I don't know how much some of those islands are inherited from the transition from braided to the modern channel, but they're pretty stable. I and mean, we've looked at aerial photos of a lot of those through the whole duration of, of you know, aerial photos, 100 years worth. And some of those islands, I mean, they're just ensconced. And of course, the uh, artifacts tell us some of those islands have been there five, six, seven thousand 7,000 years. So they were probably initially braid bars as the river was starting to transform and got vegetated and became stabilized and just become artifacts of that transformation. Yeah, I mean, Three Mile Island, you know, have a nuclear reactor in the Susquehanna. <coughs> so, yeah, we're thinking of them as stable. <laughs> that affects a lot of streams and rivers that have been transformed. But, uh, again, and what it depends on with that, with that agriculture, though, is if uh, the nature of the, of the landscape, 
agriculture tends to liberate a lot of fine grain material. If you have low gradient systems, it can completely transform them. If you have steeper systems, again, they could usually accept, so to speak, a fair amount of increase in fine grain sediment and just move them through. So we're going to wrap this up here with the Platte River. Okay, finally we're getting to the end. This is going to be interesting, I think. <laughs> okay, you know, what was the old, the old saying a politician tells when, hey, wake that guy up next to you, and the guy says, hey, you put him to sleep, you wake him up, right? <laughs> I know this is long, um, but hopefully you'll, you'll see this all come together here if we look at the Platte. And this is not what the Platte River looked like 100 years ago. It's fairly braided now. Um, the active channel 100 years ago, you would not have had these cottonwoods and stable islands 100 years ago. Uh, in the 1800s, Bureau of Land Management people described this river as a mile wide and an inch deep. Now, that's an exaggeration, but what they're telling you there is that was a wide, shallow channel, right? High width depth ratio. That, that's, what the, you know, that's what I would have written. River has a high width depth ratio, but that's more colorful, right? Mile wide and an inch deep. Okay, where's the plat? Um, it consists of two main branches. South Platte begins up here in the, in the Colorado Rockies, flows through Denver. North Platte in the Wyoming Rockies, flows through Wyoming to Nebraska. Um, the two, the North and South Platte come together and flow across Nebraska um, to a junction with the Missouri. Steep gradient on the high plains. What, what's Denver's, what's the nickname of the Denver city? Oh, wow. Mile high, right? So 5,280 feet roughly there. Uh, if you go to Google Earth and get an elevation off of, or a topographic map, uh, and get an elevation of the junction of the Platte River in the Missouri, it's about 940 feet above sea level. Uh, so you're seeing 4,000 feet of elevation change along the course of that river. That's a pretty steep gradient. So this river um, has a relatively steep gradient. It gets its discharge as big snow melt every spring out of the Rockies. Um, picks up a lot of coarse material coming out of the mountains. Uh, if we look at this map, here's the North Platte, South Platte to get you reoriented. You notice an area called the Sand Hill region. Uh, during last glacial maximum, there was an ice sheet right here, and this was a big dune field um, of sand, a very you know, unvegetated landscape. Uh, cold winds coming off the glacier, mobilizing this sand. So there's a big sand, it's what's called the Sand Hill region. Okay? Big source of sand for the river. So, and here's a ground view of the dune field now stabilized by grasses, but anytime you know, there are gullies and channels flowing through here, it feeds sand to the Platte. So the Platte gets a slug of discharge from the mountains, coarse material from the mountains and the Sand Hill region, big dune fields here in uh, high plains of Colorado, Wyoming, and certainly Nebraska. Okay? Um, so it has, a, in the natural world, steep regional gradient, heavy sand bed load from the Rockies and Sand Hills, Big increase in discharge every spring from snow melt in the Rockies. So what this river did naturally, the natural status then, because of all of that, was uh, getting all that water, coarse material. Um, this river would go through an episode of, you know, huge uh, migration of bed load that would form lingoid bars everywhere. The big flow would come out, and then braid bars from last year would get remobilized, and you'd have wall-to-wall -wall lingoid bars stacked in echelon migrating down the the river, um, and, and everything's moving. Discharge drops in the summer, grasses and shrubs might start to grow on the islands or bars. <clears throat> Next year, big load, big flow of water would uproot that stuff. The river would, would, current, would flow back. The whole river, I, I, there are pictures you'll see in, in, in um, uh, B, BLM books and so forth, journals. The whole river would look like this. Lingoid bars stacked in echelon all the way across and migrating. And then as the discharge dropped into the summer, braid bars would start forming. They would be sandbars, a little bit of grass growing on them. Next year, all that stuff got remobilized. So the channel stayed wide and shallow and actively braided. So you'd have lingoid bars converting into braid bars, wide and shallow. Next year, big discharge would convert those braid bars back to migrating lingoid bars, maintain a beautiful uh, braided pattern here. The wildlife connection, the uh, sand hill cranes, um, they, they winter in the Gulf of Mexico and so forth. They fly north to Canada uh, in, the, in the spring and reproduce in Canada. They spend up to a month on the Platte River here. Now these birds are skittish. They're long-legged wading birds. Um, they're starting to, um, you know, make, I don't know, <laughs> romantic connections, you know. <laughs> um, yeah. 
that you know, this this river becomes essential for their growth. They, they you know the the growth of the population, maintenance of the population. They natural world. They fed on natural grain uh, during the day and at night. They go roost in the river. Fox or coyote can't sneak up on them in the water. The water is shallow enough. They could roost, no problems. They'd sleep in the river. They feed on invertebrates as well, but mostly grain. We start planting corn here. They feed on the on the the, the silage and so forth. Uh, put on weight and then continue to migrate to the north. Uh, so about a half million of these birds use this river in, in March typically every year. When do they go back to the Gulf to meet British patrols? What's that? <laughs> when do they go back to the Gulf to meet British patrols? I don't know. I would, you know, I would guess probably September, October. So yeah. And uh, they're going to have to yeah, hopefully they're going to be smart enough to shift their location a little bit and get on the south end of things down there. But um, anyway, what's that? Uh, I'd, I'd say this bird standing here about two to three feet. Uh, they're big birds. Very skittish too. I'd never, I didn't take this picture. Um, I, I, my pictures are, are like dots way in the distance. When I was working on a Platte River, looking at, I didn't work on transformation of pattern. I was looking at bar dynamics here. Um, but I could never sneak up on these birds. Uh, they have blinds there that you can get close to and f photograph them. I was telling David the other day, you have to get on the waiting list well in advance to reserve a blind. Uh, and then pretty much all of the hooping cranes, which are endangered, a couple hundred of them use this river as well. Uh, this is an aerial photograph of cranes roosting in the river. So you see big uh, flocks of them. Now, the connection, remember, is this, wide and shallow. That river's morphology is everything to these birds. If it's narrow and deep, they're out. They can't, they can't do this. Is it up on the way back, too? I don't know. I don't think so. I think it's more on the way up. And that's the, that's the, big, that's the big migration where they, where they stop there and, and feed up and, and put, put on weight as well. Um, and so if we look at this as just a plot of flow depth versus velocity, and all this tells us is that they need, they like higher velocity and shallow depths. So this braided pattern is everything to, to where these birds will roost and where they'll hang out in the river. Now, what's happened? Uh, right back in the late 1800s, um, small dams were being constructed up in the Rockies to start trapping that snow melt because you're trying to grow something up there or sustain yourself. You watch that snow melt, big slug of water goes down the creek and then it's dry. And you're thinking, that water's wasted. I put a dam here, irrigation ditch, I can sustain myself. So they start putting dams, small dams, up in the tributaries, late 1800s. And now there are about 15 significant lakes and reservoirs. This is Lake McConaughey on the North Platte, just above the junction. South Platte's coming in right here from the south. Uh, but there are a bunch of these uh, big dams. Here is McConaughey. You can see the dune field topography up here. Um, the import South Platte coming along here. Um, and what these dams do is trap the sediment. That bed load doesn't move through dams, so sediment supply is much reduced, and they knock off that big snowmelt discharge peak that comes every spring. Uh, there are irrigation canals that come off of the, the plat all over the place, so there again you see sand hills topography, so putting dams on the river, irrigation um, discharge points, and the peak discharge is being completely uh, diminished on the river, and the dams trap the sediment. So we, everything the river needed to be braided, we pretty much have shut off. And this, these two figures here show two different places, the peak discharge annually. So you look at the early 1900s, and you're getting these you know, fluctuations from year to year, big snowpack year, low snowpack year, but you're getting di maximum discharge on the order of 100, 150 cubic meters per second. And now after all the big dams were in place and closed, uh, you look into the 40s, 50s, 60s, the average, you know, if we were to take this an average uh, discharge through that time period to that time period, you're seeing a reduction of 75, 80 percent. That reduction in flow would reduce the flooding on the Mississippi? Uh, probably not enough to make a big impact That's because, one river of a yeah, this is, this is right, this is a small, when you think about the, the major inputs to the Mississippi, this is a relatively smaller compared to the Missouri, Arkansas, a lot of the other rivers, but yeah, it would probably reduce it a little. And then another place, again, just imagine, that's sort of the average peak flow, here's the average peak flow after. So you knock off the discharge, what that means is that grass, those shrubs, those little things that start growing on the bars and islands, they're not getting swept away next year. Last year's braid bars stay braid bars next year, the year after, the year after, Next thing you know, you've got cottonwoods growing on them. 
So in a natural status, we had peak flow converting braid bars to migrating bars, so lingoid bars to braid bars. Next year's peak flow would convert braid bars to lingoid bars. You've got a braided river. The, the, the cranes are happy. It's all good. Now with a lower peak discharge, vegetation can get established on those braid bars. And, and last year's braid bars don't get reconverted to lingoid bars. Watch this. Um, this is the story. You used to have these little bars migrating, turn into braid bars, stall, sit there for a year. Next year, they'd get swept away, right? Now, vegetation starts to convert these things to islands that are stable. These islands start to get connected to the floodplain. And before you know it, what was a multi-channel braided river becomes a, you know, a, 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 an island braided, maybe a single channel river. What's that look like in the real world? The Platte River, if we could have flown over here in 1850, the one boundary of the river would have been here, the other boundary would have been here. Okay? <coughs> now this is what you have. Can't, I mean, all those other slides, you see migrating lingoid bars on the bed? You can't see that here. The bed's getting, a crane can't wade, wade there. Question? Also, once upon a time, uh, was incredibly wide, mm -hmm. and, and and now uh, is, is extremely faster than the Mississippi, and, and and not nearly as wide, and uh, it's controversial because it changes the, the flooding pattern, and, and people who live in the North Missouri versus the Lower Missouri have different interests and, and want to see it. Army Corps go back and redo river. Right, to try to re reclaim it or um, restore it. Yeah, and it, and it is a, a big river. The yeah, river. and there's a lot of dams on that river too. So there are a lot of, I mean, we've transformed that river actively as well as passively. This one, what's amazing, it's pretty passive. It's, it's stopping the peak discharge and tra trapping the sediment load. I mean, this river is just being completely transformed. So look at some numbers of channel width. You know, in 1860s, at two different <coughs> places, Kozad and Overton, you know, 1,200 to 1,600 feet wide, or meters wide, I'm sorry. And then you come to modern environment, modern times, and you're down to 400 and 200. So uh, the river has been completely changed. This shows at one site at Kozad, the island area. <coughs> so a few islands in, in total area for a section of river increased tremendously. Um, and then the channel area, meaning how much is active water, decreased tremendously. Okay? So this river has been completely changed um, and now it's an island braided depending on where you are in the river it's island braided um, or uh, going to a single channel in, in many cases. So um, the, there's a, 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 a trust fund, the Hooping Crane Trust Fund that was established um, by s suing water managers and so forth, a lot of significant uh, legal action to establish a fund to try to maintain uh, habitat for these birds. So in the central plat, plat sort of the Big Bend area, uh, they went in, and I was there in the early 80s, they were just gearing up to, bull, to chainsaw trees off of islands and, and start plowing them to keep uh, vegetation from lasting and then also to get the dam managers to have a release of water to, to mobilize some of the beds. So they're maintaining a semi-braided pattern uh, here in the central plat uh, that, that um, where the, where the sandhill uh, cranes can, can roost. You can see that. And so that, this is the Grand Island area. So the channel is, is still not like it used to be, but there's enough habitat um, that the birds are able to use, this, um, to use this, uh, this river the way they did to maintain their population. So this is an example of how sort of unintended consequences. No one thought this river would change like that. No one wanted this river to change like that. Just wanted to manage water uh, to sustain people in a dry land environment. Everything to keep in mind, those soils are sandy. Corn is a water intensive, you know, they're the corn huskers, right? A lot of corn growth in Iowa, Nebraska, it's a water intensive plant and those soils are sandy. So they don't retain water well either. Um, and so they have to irrigate to maintain um, those crops. And the net effect was to transform this river uh, and again, you know, get to, I'll get to your question in a second, but I also want to point out, you know, your question of climate change. These sorts of transformations will happen with climate change. Um, and to give you some sense of tomorrow, David will start with some global picture water resource issues and then also bring it back to the local scale. Um, if you read 
the um, description of what you're supposed to get today. We were supposed to talk about dams on the Osage, the Colorado River. Um, I was overly ambitious, and even with what I did here, but uh, take note of the fact that we could have, I could have erased the Platte through the Colorado River in as an example of water resource utilization and channel change. I could have looked at the Osage River and the construction of a couple of dams for flood control, water supply, and imp impacts on that river system. So we often um, get a big response by manipulating rivers without meaning to. Now, we've at the same time manipulated some rivers, and you look at them and say, well, they didn't really change much. And it, it, you know, think back to the fact that we're dealing with stability diagrams. The plat was obviously, um, the disruptions were significant, but the river was also um, not that different in terms of uh, controlling variables from reverting over to a single channel river. So climate change will do this too, and I think we are right at the uh, sunset picture. And I'll ask, answer your question, any other questions, and then I'll say to you, you know, we have a 15-minute break. You, have, you can have, you can be done for the day if you want. Um, but, if you all, but if you're interested, what I did uh, last night was create a little braided channel in our flume over in Van Wickle. Um, the flume's about six feet wide and 30 feet long. And uh, there are some lingoid bars frozen in place that you could see and some braid bars. Um, I constructed them, though, I didn't have time to run this thing to create a braided pattern naturally. But what I'll do is turn the water back on. You can watch sediment transport. And then we do this in environmental geology for the, with the students. We, we go through the whole Platte River story, get them a braided pattern. They look at braid dynamics. We turn off the sediment feeder, reduce the discharge. They go upstairs, work on some other things in the lab, come back down, and they see a river that is transformed in a half hour or so. So I just throw this out there as an open invitation. If you want to come over to Van Wickle, I'll lead everybody over that wants to go about five. You can leave there whenever you want. Um, if you don't, you know, if you, you're just a information overload, <laughs> um, you know, that's fine. Fully understand that. This is just an optional activity. And your question. The, the, <clears throat> what is the impact of the sediment where it's blocked at the dam. Is that having an impact on the efficiency of the dam? They lose, they lose storage capacity, and that's a big, that is a big issue with, with dams uh, all over the place. Now, I don't know the details of those particular dams and what, you know, obviously what the total storage capacity is, but yeah, they lose, they lose their effectiveness. There are dams um, that I have in my teaching collection of pictures in California that there's a dam and here's a sediment pile. They're, they're no longer functioning dams uh, completely out of commission. Some dams they dredge. Uh, depending on their purposes, Corps of Engineers will go in with dredges and remove sediment from behind dams. Um, on the plat, I'm not, I'm not, I don't know the answer to that question in terms of are they having big problems up there or, or collectively, are they getting enough sediment storage elsewhere? The other thing to keep in mind, as this river transforms, it's storing a heck of a lot of sediment in the channel itself uh, between dams, so to speak. So the effects of this dam um, on the channel segment downstream probably offset, mitigate some of the loss of storage capacity of the next dam in the system. Um, yeah. So, David. No. No, in terms of sediments? Yeah. That's a big deep one. Yeah. I heard though that something like 74% of the storage capacity is already compromised. Wow. And now... You know, with that river, if you've seen any pictures of those dams, those reservoirs, Lake Mead and so forth, they've got horrible bathtub rings on them. Uh, you know, that's a good example of climate change and, and hydrology in the west. The Colorado River flow has is, is been down steady for the last couple of decades. And uh, you look at those storage reservoirs, um, you know, that's, that's really intriguing to think. Not only losing capacity, the water level is still below um, the storage that they'd like to maintain. Yeah. Do you, do you see a lot of artificially um, created changes to rivers to get it to negate the artificial changes that have been made before to get us back to where we were we're, once in the we're trying I mean one thing you you'll notice um, I would imagine some of you are in, involved I'll just pass these out for for you if you want to read more about rivers um, and just pass them around this is a, a I guess I was supposed to give you reading assignments in advance, and at first I thought, I don't know that they need to read anything. I thought, well, maybe they'll be curious afterwards and want to read something. So there's something, and then I just, and I'm going to get to your question. Don't, don't forget that. Um, I'm just trying to be efficient and do two things at once. And then here's a little thing I took off of the National Wildlife uh, uh, website 
on the Platte River. So if you're curious about what's been going on in some litigation, there's a few pages on that. Um, yes, this is if you're involved in local watershed associations or something, one of the things you quickly realize is one of the, uh, the big movement, so to speak, in the U.S. is, is channel restoration. And so we're doing a lot of... And you know, we're trying to restore a lot of rivers, and some of them, that, and that's, it, there's a big controversy in my world, in the fluvial geomorphology community, about what's attainable and what's reasonable. Um, in many cases, we've changed the, the watershed so much that to try to expect the river to function the way it used to is, is physically impossible almost. Um, some restoration efforts, uh, I would tell you this, if you've had experience with any restoration that failed, I would encourage you not to just, as the old saying goes, throw the baby out with the bathwater and think that, oh, well, this never works. Uh, because rivers are so dynamic, and there are a lot of people doing restoration work that really aren't well trained in recognizing the dynamics, some restoration works are failing but badly, and sometimes millions of dollars are what you see, wasted. But a lot of others are doing really well, and so like anything, it's, we're going to vibrate around some average condition for a while before people have figured out what rivers can be restored in a, and what's a reasonable goal to try to attain. Um, but yeah, there's a lot of attempts to try to offset our land use activity. You know, the reason our students are working down on the Bushkill is there, uh, the Bushkill Stream Conservancy would like to see that lower dam and a couple other dams removed on the Bushkill. So we're trying to characterize the situation to help predict how things will, will change with the dam removed. So yeah, there's a lot of river restoration efforts and efforts to try to offset land use activities and our manipulation of systems. But what it comes down to, and this is really a good thing to just keep in mind, you know, we all have heard the saying, no such thing as a free lunch. I mean, when you manipulate a system, you might elicit really highly undesirable results. But you need water resources. With climate change, water resources become more critical in many climatic regimes. And, you know, it, it's, it's a major challenge to utilize water resources without pushing the system, um, you know, into a destabilized situation. And one of the things that um, we try to identify are thresholds. You know, the, the, where's, the, where's the point at which um, the system is pushed beyond the current state of equilibrium and it's going to change? And there are many rivers that, that we use water resources on and they haven't transformed. Um, they were probably somewhere closer, you know, or further away from that boundary, in that middle category. And that's where the energy really needs to go more in looking at the system before you manipulate it and try to envision what might happen. But boy, there are surprises. Um, I mean, we're even talking about if the dams get removed down here, we want to characterize it. And David's going to, with his students, gonna try to model how the longitudinal profile is going to adjust and so forth. But in the end, you know, if it happens today, right, what first thing we want to see is, okay, Let's, let's survey the aftermath and see how close we got. It, it's, it is a very inexact science, despite my effort to try to say we've got them figured out. I mean, there's, there was variability in every data set I showed you. I know of no, I know of no data set in fluvial genome. When I, see them, when I see those data points line up too close to the line, I get suspicious. You know, <laughs> there should be more scatter, I always think. Franklin. There was a big push when we were in school they wanted to build the dam across the Delaware Water Gap. Yeah, Cox Island Dam, right. yeah. And it, it, it went back and forth. And that, that would have transformed a hell of a lot. Oh, yeah. We were just up there this weekend, or this last week, rather. I was up there with some people from the Park Service looking at some facilities. And, boy, that's a, you know, I'm, I'm going to leave for vacation Saturday. And one of the things I'm reading is the Tox Island Dam book is one of the things I'm going to read. But, boy, you see the families that were displaced? for that reservoir, that's really tragic. But I look at that landscape and I think all the time, thank goodness that reservoir never went in. Um, I'd much rather see that river free flowing and uh, that's, a, that's such a beautiful, beautiful place. If any of you guys have an extra day on the other end of this weekend, boy, drive up through the water gap. Uh, Count Zinzendorf, one of the Moravians said, the view is entirely worth a trip across the Atlantic in a ship. And that was 1700s, right? <laughs> So, you know, a rental car, 50, you know, 30 miles up Route 611, I think would be a great investment. So, anyway, thanks for, uh, thanks for, uh,